Thank you very much uh, for joining us on a Friday afternoon for the people who are in the US, Central or Eastern. I know we also have some people from France or Europe. Uh, so it's a pleasure uh, to have you today with us uh, for a discussion that was missing to be invigorating and fascinating. Our little cause read would be around Annie Curtius' new book, Suzanne Césaire, Archaeologie littéraire et artistique d'une mémoire empêchée. Another subtitle for this book that deals with various encounters could have been entre mauvaises rencontres et rencontres heureuses en contexte transatlantique. Between good and bad encounters in a transatlantic context. Annie Curtius' book indeed delves into transatlantic negotiations that encompass discussion of race, gender, identities, and cultural production, among other things, in the French Caribbean. Yes, this book is very rich. So let me quickly introduce our discussants and panelists. First, I would like to start with a dear friend, Gladys Francis. I wanted to let you know that if you look at the bottom of the screen, you will see the chat. I'm going to put some links to give you more information about all panelists, because if I was doing a very long introduction, I would have a lot to say uh, with all of them. So you will have links whenever each panelist is talking about their research, and I will put that in the chat at one point. Do not hesitate at any time to click on the bottom of the screen Q&A whenever you have a question. So Gladys Francis, that I first met because she sent me an email and asked me to be a part of the panel. And I was like, who is that? And then I was like, oh, she's from the Caribbean. I'm doing it. Uh, she's a great researcher. Her research involved Francophone studies, theory and cultural studies, African and African America, diaspora studies. You can already see why she's a part of this panel. On top of that, she's also delved into visual and media studies, women, gender, sexuality studies. And what is very uh, specific about her work is that she explores rural urban resilience, race and identity, gender-based violence, transcultural violence. She's the author of the book, Odious Caribbean Women, published by Lexington Books in 2017, a monograph that investigates representation of violence and the abhorrent in the works of Caribbean women writers and visual artists. Her edited book, Love, Sex, Gender, and Trauma in the French Caribbean, was published by L'Armatan, Paris, 2016, and has great contribution, among which works by Simone Schwarzbach, Fabienne Canor, and also uh, Jocelyne uh, Biroir. Our second panelist will be Nathan Dates, or Dice. I wanted to ask him how to, I knew I was pronounce it wrong. I'm so sorry. I dreamt about it. And of course I did it. So now let's go over that. So Nathan dies. Doctor now is just received his PhD. I think it's February or January. January. Nice. Welcome among the great circles of thinkers. Well, this is what we think about, but seriously, just happy you finished your dissertation. So he received his PhD from the Department of French and Italian at Vanderbilt University, but he's also already before receiving uh, his degrees, he was already a very active scholar. He's the content curator, translator, and co-editor of the Digital History Project, A Colony in Crisis, the Saint-Domingue Grain Shortage of 1789, with Siobhan May, he co-edits the Haiti in Translation interview series for H. Haiti. He also translated poetry fiction by numerous Haitian authors, including Kately Moss, Charles Moravia, James Noel, Naomi Pierre Daomé, and Evelyn Trouille. And last but not least, his translation of Mackenzie Orsell's The Immortals was published in November 2020 with Sony Press. Now, Last but not least, Annie Curtius. There's much I could say about Annie's scholarship, about the rigor of her work and the finesse of the methodology she has developed. She is the author of Symbiose du Mémoire, 
Manifestations religieuses et littérature de la Caraïbe, published by L'Armatan in 2006. And she wrote many articles and essays, and later on, I will put links that you could click on to find more information about uh, a great work. She's working currently uh, on a fabulous project which focuses on slavery museums and memorials and the post-colonial and eco-critical narrativization of trauma and memory. She explores how memory communities are formed and how subjectivities are impacted, tested, and challenged in new museums and memory sites. In her latest book, the book we're going to talk about today, she grounds her discussion in a close reading of many documents, which include Suzanne Césaire's work, but also some photos and documentaries, for instance. Her work is not a biography of Suzanne Césaire, but nevertheless presents her as a fascinating historical protagonist, not as a flat character. Annie's goal is not to create another mythology, but to present the complexity of the woman who has contributed a lot to French Caribbean literature and culture and who deserve to be better studied and recognized. Annie Curcio's interdisciplinary research lies at the crossroads of Francophone studies, which includes social cultural theory, literature, cinematic, visual, and performing arts of the Caribbean, the, Ocean, the Indian Ocean, and West Africa. And last but not least, eco-criticism. She's also interested, as demonstrated by uh, In Progress book, in slave memorials, comparative post-colonial museum studies, and discusses, in a word, the intangible cultural heritage in the global South. Her interdisciplinary approach produces the richness of a book of the study we'll discuss today, dedicated to Suzanne Césaire. However, most importantly, Annie is a generous and supportive scholar and a beautiful human being. It may sound trite, but she is nice. Although that does not prevent her from being a very rigorous and careful scholar, I had the pleasure to have her read several of my drafts and she showed no mercy in a nice way. I first met her at a 2004 conference in Martinique. She did not look down at me because I had only just finished my master's and was about to start my PhD. I don't even remember what we talked about. I just remember how she made me feel because you know, it's all about how I feel really. Uh, I remember that our discussion helped me recover from the ordeal of passing my final master's exam. Since then, we collaborated on several projects and here we are today. I've always valued the work and her as a person. So Annie, is my first question for you. In fact, really I have several questions in one. For the people in the audience who have not read your book, all the interviews you have uh, given about that study. Why Susan Césaire? When did you first met her? When did you first meet her? Why did you feel the need to write this very detailed study? Okay, thank you Jacqueline for this very generous and moving presentation. You're gonna make me cry. Um, <laughs> So, um, and also I want to thank um, everyone. I want first to thank the Gladys and Nathan for taking the time to read my book and comment on it. Thanks Jacqueline for um, organizing this very uh, interesting, rigorous and rich event. And thank you to all the panelists who are taking the time out of your busy schedule to listen to us. So, the question, um, there is always a story behind uh, a book. Um, I first met, if I can use the verb meet, I met Susan Cesar for the first time when I was a graduate student in comparative literature at the University of Montreal. And I had um, two advisors and one of them, um, at one point we were discussing one of my chapters and he said, well, we probably need to go to 
tropic, we need to consult tropic to understand something that you're saying here that, that probably doesn't really make sense. We need to see how tropic deals with the, the issue of nature, Caribbean nature. And um, at that time, I knew very little about uh, Susan. Well, actually, I didn't even know that she had written um, any thing in Tropic, if I can say so. And I knew little about Tropic itself. So we started to talk, we started to read. And then the first article I read during that conversation during, and, and subsequently was Alain et l'esthétique. And then I found it so, so odd that for someone like me, born in Martinique, born and raised in Martinique, that I had never heard about her, read about Tropique, or read Tropique. And I was actually, I think, kind of like vividly remember the, the, the way I felt at this particular moment. It was some, it was shame, sadness for having missed you know, the opportunity of reading uh, such a powerful article. And later on, when I started really to dig into more, um, most of the works, I realized that I had definitely missed something. So at that point, Jacqueline, it was obvious to me that I needed to uh, focus on a work. I didn't know when I was gonna start, but for me, it was definitely a revealing moment, that discussion with one of my co-advisors. So, um, so I published my third book while still connecting, still reading Tropic and Suzanne, of course, rereading multiple times those articles. And every time I read them, I could find something new, something that I thought that I had missed, but probably I had misunderstood. So, and even today, even after I finished this book, when I reread Suzanne's articles, I found something else. I find something revealing that needs to be addressed. So I guess that when I, when I finished the book, I, was, I had the feeling that I still needed to write a second book that I had not finished, that there were a lot of things that I needed to say that I could not find in the book. So. Um, so I guess that this book is a preface. To me, it's a preface, it's a prelude, and I still need to, to dig in. So um, the signature of my work, if I can say so, is to, it's to excavate what is overlooked. And I think that I would probably label my work as, uh, my research as the poetics of what is considered micro, hidden, poor, illegitimate narratives. So in a sense, my argument is that there is nothing that is insignificant to nurture a literary discourse, to nurture a cultural history. And this is precisely what I'm doing, what I have done with this book. I remember when I was applying for a, I mean, I applied for a grant some years ago and this book was the, the project that I submitted. And one of the reviewers, or maybe two reviewers, commented on the insignificance of the work. Not so much that it was not worth reading, but she had not written enough. Just seven articles were not worth an entire book. That was basically the, the the general view of those comments. And I also remember that one of the reviewers was saying, how about just writing a book with, uh, where you would include Suzanne Césaire and put her in conversation with other women? Because what she wrote is not enough, basically, to just um, focus on her in one single authored book. And uh, I think that those comments really strengthened my, um, my desire to, to, to push forward and to realize that seven articles is not too little. It depends how you read those articles. It depends what you do with the articles. Numbers is something, 
I mean, are something, but then the critical analysis that you do with a text is something else. So, so that's how Jacqueline I discovered. That's a long answer. I could go on forever. But that's um, first as a graduate student and as I am, you know, developing, still developing my research and thinking about what I do and the way I do it. For me, it was um, absolutely necessary to also realize that Suzanne Caesar's thought should not exist in a vacuum. What I mean by that is that we scholars, cultural critiques, cultural historians, we should not just say, okay, we're gonna just focus on Suzanne Césaire and that's it. On the contrary, she should be put in conversation with a lot of cultural theorists from the Caribbean and from other parts of the world, I would say. Um, and um, I think that I can stop there, but I could, uh, I think, uh, I couldn't strengthen enough the need for us not to homogenize the complexity of Caribbean thought. A work allows us to adopt several genealogies of thinking and not just one. And unfortunately, she's been trapped in this category of classification, exclusion, and um, to me, there is something absolutely mind-boggling with the ways in which she has been um, she has been treated, and she's still treated. And thanks to you guys, Jacqueline, Gladys, Nathan, and other scholars whose work I really admire, I'm really happy to see the ways in which she's been resurfacing, you know, and really being uh, put. I mean, given the, the, the place that she deserves in Caribbean critical theory. So I'll stop there, otherwise I could go on forever. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Annie. Uh, and to go literally with what you just saying, um, this idea that, you know, seven articles are enough. With seven articles, you have really um, written a thick, detailed, and very interesting book for us. And in highlighting the richness of your work, I would be remiss not to note uh, that your study is also a meditation on eco-criticism and environmental humanities and the way in which individual of African descent whose ancestors were forcibly taken and transported into a new space interacted within those new spaces. You demonstrate for me how Suzanne Césaire was among the first ones of the first writers, authors to think about the relationships of Afro-descendants with the land, their connection with the island, and how to present this connection in a more positive fashion without exoticism. She clearly wonders how to ground the Martinican, both women and men, in its land, in their lands, make them accept its beauty and horror and the heaviness of the past. Interestingly enough, Susan Césaire's work foreshadows the work of a recent scholar, such as Malcolm Ferdinand, in his Ecologie des Colonies. Decolonial, uh, published in 2019, Decolonial Ecology. Although Ferdinand takes inspiration from Aimé Césaire and Edouard Glissant's work, for Ferdinand, for a decolonial ecology to be truly inclusive as far as race, gender, and class are concerned, and to uncover the intricate consequences of colonialism, it must be grounded in the Caribbean world. Namely, and I quote in French and in English, dans les pratiques et les discours, dans les histoires et les poésies, dans les littératures et les œuvres du monde caribéen, in practices and discourses, in stories, histories, and poems, in literatures and works of the Caribbean world, end of quote. We find that Suzanne Césaire was already tackling issue of eco-criticism, eco-poetics, if not ecology avant la lettre, 
in the 1940s. The same could be said of Jacques Roumain and his novel, Gouverneur de la Rosée. And to conclude, in fact, I would like to concentrate quickly on your last chapter. Because for me, this concluding section opens the discussion to broader possibilities around the work and contribution of Suzanne Césaire. In your introduction, Annie, uh, you already set the tone and highlighted this book, but this book is all about transatlantic discussions and negotiation. And I really enjoy the fact that you mentioned how Martinican and Guadeloupian authors, thinkers, writers, such as Marie Condé, Daniel Maximin, Guy Cabormasson, and René Menil, for instance, engaged Suzanne's work and legacy. And you also mentioned and highlighted how Condé might have been the first one to bring forth the importance of Suzanne Césaire. You also mentioned the celebration around the centennial anniversary of Suzanne's birth and the 50th anniversary, anniversary of her death, even organized, most of them, by L'Union des Femmes de Martinique, the Union of Women of Martinique. For me, you remind us, and it's important, that these French Antillean writers and associations efforts to engage or discuss Suzanne's contribution marks in a way the importance of the engagement of French Antillans in the memory of the past or the memorialization of great figures. So we cannot say that we're not interested in our culture. French Antilles, for various reasons, have always been interested in these particular women at one point or another. In other chapters, you discuss French scholars not born in Martinique and their vision of uh, Suzanne Césaire. However, the last chapter is important to me because it's the je. The last chapter is all about the voice of Suzanne Césaire. She speaks. In the last chapter, what I really enjoy is the way in which you picked several quotes uh, to present her own vision. You offer a close reading uh, of excerpts of Suzanne Césaire's essay. And your last section is, I think is going to be particularly rich and useful for people who are interested in Caribbean theory or in theorizing uh, Caribbean literature. With the quotes from Suzanne Césaire, you conceptualize what you call Lian dialectic, Liana dialectics, dialectics of the Liana or dialectics of the tropical vine. To conceptualize the theoretical methodology used in Suzanne Césaire's in Suzanne Césaire's Caribbean Ecopoetics. You see this concept of Lian dialectic as a cultural theory anchored, I could I say rooted, but I will use anchored in the Caribbean landscape. There are six Lian dialectic, and I will quickly uh, discuss Lian dialectic number five because it's all about my interest. And I will read it quickly and I made a translation of it. Les anches, les anches de Bergile ont pris au roulé monté des abîmes, au flanc des volcans, leur allure de cataclysme. Ici, sur cette terre chaude qui garde vivante les espèces géologiques, la plante fixe, passion et sang, dans son architecture primitive, l'inquiétante sonnerie des reins chaotiques des danseuses. And this is a quote from Le Grand Camouflage, and I will read the translation, um, why I don't always agree with all the ways, you know, they translated it, but it was just the easiest way to do it. Bergil's hips have taken their cataclysmic speed from the heaving rising from the death to the flanks of the volcanoes. The fixed plant, passion and blood in its primitive architecture, the disquieting ringing suddenly issue from the chaotic backs of the dancers. Right now I'm finishing an article on dance um, in Martinique and Guadeloupe. 
And the dialectics five, this particular section is very important to me and has been um, instrumental in my writing because Virgil is the ballet dancer. She's the dancer of the traditional dances that have been born or reborn uh, when enslaved Africans were dropped uh, in Martinique. When I think about Virgil's hips, I'm thinking about the concentration of power and the body and how her hips is an anchor uh, into the land. And I could go on and on and on, but that, that would be uh, in my article. That's why I talk about anchor, because for me, the hips is anchoring us. If you think about Groca and traditional type of dances, whether Groca, ballet, the hips and the feet and their connection to the land is for me the way many Martinicans or Guadalupeans have anchored or have tried to anchor themselves in uh, the land. This last section reminds us the very importance of cultural productions as dance and music and how they were created or reborn in the French Caribbean to help people find a sense of self. And I will quickly finish with two quotations from the discussion of Dialectic 5, that for me uh, summarizes really greatly the contribution of your work. French first and then the English. And those quotes shows the beauty of the great contribution to the senses there to Caribbean theory. And here, this is what Annie is telling us. Cette complexité identitaire qu'elle analyse dans tous ses textes doit être soumise, nous dit-elle, à un appareil conceptuel et à une épistémologie nouvelle capable de gérer cette multidimensionnalité. Je propose que sa liane dialectique, qui lui a permis de construire une positionnalité translocale, annonce à la fois la relation de Glissant et l'intersectionnalité de Kimberly Crenshaw et de Patricia Hill Collins dans leur manière d'interroger le divers. The complexity of identity that she analyzes in her corpus must be guided, she tells us, by a conceptual apparatus and a new epistemology capable of managing this multi-dimensionality. I propose that her Lian dialectic the uh, dialectic liner, which allowed her to construct a translocal positionality, announces both the notion of a relation conceptualized by Glissant and the concept of intersectionality as defined by Kimberly Crenshaw and Patricia Hill Collins in their ways of questioning the diverse. That's the first quote. And the final quotes. La pensée féministe de Suzanne Césaire est comme les lianes balance de vertige. Elle nous invite à théoriser la complexité de la multidimensionnalité et non les, ban euh, les binarismes simples. Elle annonce les vertiges théoriques qui nous attendent, chercheuses et chercheurs, pour repenser cette multidimensionnalité en contexte occidental, postcolonial et post-contact. Suzanne Césaire's feminist thought is like the tropical vines rocking vertiginously. So this is a quote again from the great camouflage. She invites us to theorize the complexity of multi-dimensionality and not simple binarisms. She announces the theoretical dizziness that awaits us as researchers to make us rethink this multi dimensionality in a Western post-colonial and post-contact post -contact context. That is why I've decided to invite two great scholars to share with us their ideas on Annie's work, but also on Suzanne Assezer's work. So I will give the floor right now um, to Gladys Francis, and I will post in the chat some links also about her work. So Gladys, the floor is yours now. Merci Jacqueline. Messieurs Jacqueline, qu'a fout fait? Bon. 
Uh, bien bonjour, bonjour, hello everybody. Uh, first, I want to thank Dr. Jacqueline Couty for this book salon invitation. Uh, merci for making space for us to gather together. I am humbled and honored to share space with you all in order to discuss Dr. Annie Dominique Cursus' new academic book, Suzanne Césaire, Archéologie littéraire et artistique d'une mémoire empêchée. In the book's avant-propos, Dr. Cursius presents her research as an archaeological journey that should not be conceived, as Dr. Coty said, as Suzanne Césaire's biography, but rather as an investigation during which she encountered countless unexplained gaps. And uh, Jacqueline, I would like to share my screen. Um, as a result, As a result, Curtius invites us to consider her book as a documentation of fragments. She utterly examines so that she utterly examines so as to rehabilitate not only Suzanne Césaire's lived experiences in the literary and artistic worlds, but most importantly, Curtius offers to also critically rehabilitate and analyze the complex rhetoric of reserve and avoidance the practices of amnesia, and the travesties that are also significant experiences surrounding Suzanne Césaire as she is being silenced, praised, or camouflaged during her life and after her death. Hence, the book offers an exploration of the many fragmentations that occur at the margins of artistic, cultural, or literary appropriateness. It provides an ecosystem that disrupts the decorum avorté on Suzanne Césaire. Cursius is blunt when she explains the importance of tracing the agents that gave birth to Suzanne Césaire's critical thought. These agents are like a lionage, a, a queer world meaning attachment, bond, union, the collective, or also how one can encycle the enemy or create trouble like foutelion. Cursius understands that disrupting decades of a culture of silence, of avoidance, or reserve on Suzanne Césaire necessitates raw honesty. I call her scholarship, her scholarly contribution, a bold and transgressive one. It is indeed an unapologetic feminist marronage, a transgressive body of work that adds to our Caribbean feminist critical thought. We discover the ways in which Suzanne Césaire is politicized and imagined through Cursius' concept of lian dialectics, meant to capture the interdisciplinary and multidimensional essence of the known and unknown discourses that surround Suzanne Césaire. Hence, remonter les traces de Suzanne Césaire also excavates the neo-colonialist praxis, colonial mimesis, and violent Western eels for a hegemony and assimilation that are at play for Black people in the Caribbean and in the Metropole France. In this fashion, by centering on what Cursus calls thoughts upon geography and a geography upon thoughts, the book also contextualizes the historical, sociocultural and political settings that have delayed the visibility of Suzanne Césaire in the field of literary criticism. We quickly understand the elements of risk, tension, and courage that rest in Curtius' aim to go back and fetch Suzanne Césaire's Lyonnage. Because yes, it, is, it also means uncovering the culture of violence, voicelessness, marginalization, and invisibility when it comes to Black women from the islands who perform outside Eurocentric norms. Hence, Cursus acknowledges Amy Jacques Garvey, Paulette and Jeanne Nardal, Lucie Thézé, and Marie Vieux Chauvet, to only name but a few. As she defends, there is more excavation to be entailed. And I believe her book is a bold call for us to continue this journey of telling her story and disrupting these cultures of silence. Indeed, in France, Black artists often walk in a setting in which their creations are expected to be made from the same ingredients, the same batter, the same recipe, and met for the same audience. Suzanne Césaire never attempted to blend in or to make her Blackness invisible through La Revue Tropique. As Cursius argues, Suzanne Césaire thought 
a mainstream that does not always know how to defend projects for which they don't understand the message or the aesthetic. In Cursius analysis, we understand Suzanne Césaire's aim to restitute the voice of a community that carries the stigmas of une société esclavagiste. Suzanne Césaire understood the power of representation between the dreamed island and the real island. It is that power of representation Suzanne Césaire aimed to cannibalize when it came to creating a literary and critical Caribbean aesthetic. It is what Cursius expounds as she desire, as a desire to stop camouflaging the forbidden, the ugly, and the painful. Cursius examines the ways in which Suzanne Césaire performed her subjectivity through literature, printed photographs, and performance arts. She also proposes a thought-provoking analysis of Suzanne Césaire's attempts to control her image and intellectual works which were already subjected to doudouism, sexism, silencing, and invisibility in her lifetime. Using Diana Taylor's scholarship on performance, Cursius brings forth an analysis of Suzanne Césaire's archives as a repertoire, which serves as the ground to observe the rituals that have been utilized to represent or recognize Suzanne Césaire at the junction of an oxymoron or a crisis. Cursius' book chapters retrieves this repertoire and similar to a rehearsal, to use Diana Taylor's term, Cursius uses clarification and an apologic uh, repetition to embody Suzanne Césaire's feminist critical thought. Retrieving and rehearsing Suzanne Césaire's non-aligned lionage is, I believe, an embodied phenomenology. Artists and scholars like Edouard Glissant, uh, Lena Blue, uh, Fabienne Canor, Leon Gontran Damas tell us that Black people had to reiterate who they were to fight amnesia. They tell us that Black people also had to perform being other so they would not die again. Similarly, Cursius argues that Suzanne Césaire's repertoire is a space of survival and resistance that reveals a Caribbean ecopoetic and a transatlantic consciousness to be analyzed as a cultural form and as aesthetic. The entire book is unconventional. Uh, its organization is non-traditional. From the avant-propos to the introduction, Cursus lays out the multiple angles and paths that were necessary to unveil what she conceptualized as the ressouvenance of Suzanne Césaire. She shows careful attention to historicizing the archiving of Suzanne Césaire's traces. The term careful here is not a synonym for timid, but whether it expresses how Cursus went deeper through the use of repetitions. These repetitions became necessary when approaching delicate grounds or when entangling complex nods that required more delicate attention on our part. Cursus boldly makes the reader slow down or go back in order for them to better move forward. This is best illustrated in chapter two, where Cursus analyzes the surrealist imaginaries, the, the construction of subaltern, queer, feminine, uh, doudouism, uh, and a surrealist tropicalization of Suzanne Césaire. It is a complex lionage at the crossroads of Baudelaire, André Breton, Etienne Bleurne, Douanier Rousseau, uh, Michel Léris, and Masson. Le coup de génie of this chapter is the articulation of Ina Césaire's voice in this conversation through which Cursius brings forth a counter discourse that cannibalizes doudouism and voices Suzanne Césaire through feminine and feminist lenses. Hence, nothing is left to the obvious. Every step is put under scrutiny, however small, however big, however new, and however uncomfortable. And Annie used the term micro, and I would just say this sometimes was nano. Similarly, Cursius dares to make a prolonged stop inside Aimé Césaire's pseudo lapses in order to understand the intellectual dynamics that continued with Suzanne Césaire beyond her passing. It is indeed Suzanne Césaire's agency that is revealed and how she influenced Aimé Césaire's body of work. 
Cursus explores Suzanne Césaire's embodiment and disembodiment through dance, urban and rural ecologies, theater, literature, photography, and moving pictures. This paraphernalia of discourses allow Cursius to reveal the oxymoron or camouflage at play when Suzanne Césaire is named, but not quite, represented, but not quite, praised, but not quite, or silenced, but not quite. Cursius took all these expressions, dissected them, and offered a critical analysis with no concern of pleasing or conforming. It becomes evident as we advance in the reading that her archaeological process sets the tone for another narrative bien du bout, bien campé, in front of notorious names in the field of literature, culture, and the arts. Cursius understands that it is what it takes if one must critically address the camouflaging. Hence, yes, this research, this research project is an unapologetic feminist marronage. To move away from this culture of not quite that surrounds Suzanne Césaire, the complex paraphernalia must be retrieved, disturbed, re-engaged with, and repeated over and over. This research reveals the historically sexist coded relation to black female voices in Caribbean literary movements, as well as racially coded relationships in the canon or else what Suzanne Cook called unculturated somatophobia. Indeed, Zola, uh, the director of Urban Bush Women, reminds us that, I quote here, white cultural aesthetic is an aesthetic of privilege of not having to worry about the audience, if the audience understands what you are doing or not, end of quote. Hence, by presenting Suzanne Césaire as a pioneer of a feminist Caribbean critical thought, Cursus entails a process of decolonization that is manifold. She reinvests the spaces that hold a trace of Suzanne Césaire, divests colonial and patriarchal ideologies surrounding Suzanne Césaire, challenges imperialist practices by revitalizing Suzanne Césaire's distinct cultural and literary expressions. In fact, Cursius creates an emancipatory environment that addresses the intricacies of the long history of marginalization and silencing surrounding Suzanne Césaire. We discover that Suzanne Césaire's body of work brings forth a Caribbean literary aesthetic that is a highly sophisticated mode of being in the world. Her eco-poetic, her rejection of doodooism and sexism promote an emancipatory pedagogy, a recovering of ownership on the ways she likely experienced the world. We discover the radical becoming of Suzanne Césaire as early as the late 30s. In Cursius book, we observe Suzanne Césaire's temporally and spatially determined transgressions, as well as her anti-hegemonic strategies to escape or destabilize hierarchy, uh, mainstream idealization of the beauty of the Métis, capitalism, sexism, doodooism, and patriarchal economies of desires. A titled Cursus process and unapologetic feminist marronage because she's able to render a, a raw honesty on Suzanne Césaire's sites of self-realization, which allow the readers to get closer and to witness her marks, her lived experiences, and the objects she encountered. In this fashion, she also, uh, we, we also witness how in history, Suzanne Césaire was touched and experienced in complex or inappropriate ways. I find the process quite constructive for Cusius Sankofa experience. It illustrates her yearning for remonter la trace du passé in order to allow for a more generative space of réparation. It is what Quandalima calls a shared modernity, which is where I believe Suzanne Césaire remains hybrid in and out of time through continuous ways to rewrite herself. Hence, Cursius challenges borders and boundaries through her engaging research findings and analysis. Cursius reveals how Suzanne Césaire's call to stop our evitement or camouflage ironically pointed to what became her own presence to history. I particularly admire Cursius' metakinesis, 
her way of disrupting visual categories and resisting cultural representations of identity, as well as the way she subverts conventional frames, which we observe in the structure of the book. In fact, the book does not end with a conclusion, but with a chapter five, through which we see Suzanne Césaire's freedom to move in and out, shifting from active to transgressive functions in what becomes a disruptive frame. What a marronage indeed. I am fond of chapter five, where I believe Dr. Cursius crafts a powerful methodology to analyze Suzanne Césaire's Caribbean critical thought. We are literally positioned at the top of the Morne, atop the hill, in the middle of Tropique, as Cursius deconstructs Suzanne Césaire's imageries, narrative style, counter discourse, and critical thought. Cursius unveils Suzanne Césaire's interdisciplinary practice, how she inspired the aesthetics of other writers, was never a follower, but a woman whose intellectual wit brought her to define what she called a cannibal literature, free from colonial aesthetics. We are able to understand Suzanne Césaire's epistemology, her call to shield Caribbean literature from colonial commodification. Chapter five reveals, I believe, Suzanne Césaire's opacity and consciously subversive subjectivities are analyzed the emancipatory politics of geocorporal realities through which Suzanne Césaire sabotages both the voyeuristic gaze and the sexualized pleasure that surrounds her métissage. We see Suzanne Césaire's performance of spasming out and acting out, her cannibal reflection upon blackness and the Caribbean. It is obvious to me that Cursius put forth a feminist practice that contributes to radical politics of alternatives, leonage, knowledge making, as well as engaging witnessing through Suzanne Césaire, who is polycentric, heterogeneous. Cursius removed Suzanne Césaire as a fetish, moved her away from what Marie Scondé named a passive dichotomy. In ethnographical museums, in ethnographical uh, museums, an object can become scientifically legitimized, declared exceptional, labeled as top exhibit or masterpiece for the general public. That sanctified object comes to represent an entire culture. We need to challenge the process of musealization that removes cultural expressions and functions from their original context in order to integrate them into the academic environment of the museum institution. Whether Suzanne Césaire is put on stage, on display in a museum, on moving pictures, on photography, Cursius tells us that we need to pay attention to how contemporary transnational politics are negotiating her black body. There is this popular practice uh, in the French Caribbean that occurs solely during the wake celebration of people transitioning. When we say transitioning in the African diaspora, we often mean that the deceased can now make a utopian return to motherland Africa. In the French Caribbean, the wake is a celebration of life. I would like to share one specific practice uh, during which a storyteller gathers people in a circle. In Creole, he tells proverbs about life. And I use the pronoun he because it's usually a man uh, who do the practice in the French Caribbean. He transports the audience in another time. And René Larrier is here. And René, I do know, I do know this is changing. We do have uh, women who are doing um, 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 what the conteurs were doing. Um, the storyteller, le conteur, transports the audience in another time, another point of aperture, a tangible liminal space. At the end of this complex journey of enigmatic stories regarding life, he asks us to join our hands. He approaches every single one of us and put something in our hands. The moment is quite mystical because in reality, there is nothing inside our hands. The reason being that it simply gives us back to ourselves. As a scholar and critic, Dr. Annie Dominique Cursius 
create similar spaces of aperture, of liminality for Suzanne Césaire. I commend her for her ability to provoke, to gather, and to create an inclusive circle of convergence of discussions and critical thinking regarding Suzanne Césaire. Cursius was able to discuss issues of hedonistic and exotic representations that affected Suzanne Césaire within local, transnational, and global settings through cultural, uh, visual, and postcolonial studies. This repertoire inscribes her work as an historical archive of our public records. Thank you, Annie, for the aperture, the tangible liminal spaces you fostered around Suzanne Césaire, because in reality, as illustrated in the wake popular practice and those who receive the storyteller's gift, what we need to give to the silenced Afra communities we encounter is simple yet tremendous. We need to give them back to themselves. Merci, Annie. Thank you so much, Thank uh, you. Gladys. Thank you for bringing this fire, this passion uh, to uh, our discussion. You package way. You ready? Yes, 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 my you friend. En paré, en paré, en paré. And and this is what this book uh, I think is really about, and that's why I was talking about transnational dialogues and discussions. Uh, and we're going now to see the vision of the chercheur. Uh, so Nathan, I will give you the floor. We already have one question, but we we'll, we we'll go to the questions at the end. And I think these discussions are really going to be very useful to. Students, for instance, who are graduate students who are starting project, finishing projects, or people who are just interesting in Black studies in general and French Caribbean studies uh, in particular. Nathan, the floor is yours. Merci, Ampil. Merci beaucoup. Uh, thank you for having me here to be in discussion with all of you, this is such a wonderful occasion to talk about um, a book that I really think of as sort of a feminist guidebook to literary archaeology of the Caribbean. Um, as somebody who just finished their um, doctoral work and um, who focuses on how, how literature helps us to remember, how written traces help us to work through memory, but also to serve as memory. Um, this book is a beautiful offering to the memory of uh, Suzanne Césaire. Um, the, she is a world and she was in the world. And um, I, I find this um, perhaps best, I, I'd, I'd like to turn to um, a quotation by Toni Morrison, um, because I think it, it really, what she says in her essay, Sites of Memory, really sort of um, brings to bear a lot of what I felt while reading this book and um, why I felt this book, why I wish I had this book before I started my graduate work. Um, I'll read. Um, so Morrison writes, if writing is thinking and discovery and selection and order and meaning, it is also awe and reverence and mystery and magic. It's a kind of literary archaeology. On the basis of some information and a little bit of guesswork, you journey to a site to see what remains were left behind and to reconstruct the world that these remains imply. And to me, this is really the praxis and pedagogy of this book is that not only do you see an analysis, a rich analysis of Suzanne Césaire's work itself, but how Suzanne Césaire figures into the work and around the work of an entire cadre of people, a entire world of people, um, so that she is not just a title, a mention, um, an intertext. Um, she is in the literature. She is of the literature. Um, I also want to say, too, that the voice um, that you that you use, Dr. Kosius, in in your book, to me as a as a language learner of French, um, I, this is a voice, a particular voice that I've 
I have not encountered very much in um, literary study of the Caribbean or literary study in general in the French language because it's there's such a powerful je, there's such a, a powerful idea that you are in this archive, that you are in this world of references, of oblique regard, of indirect mention, of and, and you are trying to deal with this and sift through this. And there is not a, there isn't always a nous, there isn't always an on. There is a there is a je who is trying to piece this together. And um, in that, I find your use of language with regard to other people's work and other people's attempts to either bring Suzanne Césaire to presence um, rather than to um, absence or into study once again. Um, you refer to, for instance, Georgiana Colville's anthology as une anthologie musée. Um, I have to say that your study is an, une étude musée. Um, it is, in fact, this place, this, this repository, um, as Dr. Francis so um, poignantly mentioned about what Diana Taylor refers to as a repertoire, an archive, um, and that repertoire as an archive. Um, I also find this work to be, exist in a whole ecosystem, and I use the word ecosystem very um, intentionally, of work that is currently being done um, and, and work that is currently underway um, to provide access to these literary archives. Um, I'm thinking of um, Patty Markson's biography of Jacques Woumain, where not only does she compile texts by Jacques Woumain that had not been compiled before in translation, she brings them together um, in original translations. Um, I'm thinking about um, Annette Joseph Gabriel's um, uh, Reimagining Liberation, where we have this window onto the Césaire's trip to Haiti as part of the educational ministry, focusing instead of on Aimé, on Suzanne. And once again, you bring us to Haiti in another way. Um, you bring us to Haiti in this moment where, and, and I, I really appreciate the way that you, you talk about Suzanne's illness and, and this, this moment of her life, this very obscure moment where not everybody, everybody's not quite sure what's happening to her. Um, and I, I think there's a time where she doesn't quite know what's happening to her either. Um, and the way that you handle what is said about her, um, that her pregnancy perhaps healed her. Um, and you point to the, the, the absurdity of such, of such a, uh, a comment or, or potentially the lack of regard um, for the for Suzanne in, in that moment. And instead, you provide the care um, of the regard toward her that had been denied to her by previous critics or previous cultural uh, interpreters. And so I think you extend this space um, in, in ways that are both important as historical temporal markers to other women of the Caribbean. I'm thinking about Michel Lacroix as um, one of um, Michel Lerius's interlocutors. Um, you also bring in um, Jeanne Duval vis-a-vis -vis Baudelaire. You bring in um, Mayotte Capacia vis-a-vis um, -vis Fanon. And yet you don't let them take over the stage, but you also recognize that they are there too. Um, and you open the space um, to, to future archeologies, to future studies of, of women who when I first started studying uh, French and Francophone studies, their work were, were, were entirely out of print. Um, and I'm, I'm thankful to have had a, an advisor at my undergrad who trafficked in photocopies of these, of these texts so that I myself have my own you know, repertoire of yellowing photocopies and uh, massive PDFs from before PDFs were able to be compact. Um, this is a whole pedagogy about how to do this work and how to teach this work. I, I wrote a number of times in the margins, you need to teach this because there is a methodology at play here um, that I think draws on black studies. It draws on um, the, the work that uh, scholars in African-American diasporic studies do. And, and it puts it into a Francophone space and deals with authors and, and thinkers who are one would say canonical, and you deal with them in a way that is both in the Francophone tradition, but also outside of the Francophone tradition. And the way that you parry them along 
um, the, the Andre Bretons, the, uh, the Michel Erises, um, you show us that our, our training is in fact useful as Francophonists, but also that Black Studies is an essential piece to understanding um, the, the women, the people who are evoked in their work and how to handle things like chauvinism, uh, doodooism, um, and, and other discourses that filter in where, um, you know, as, as a student, one might say, one might come across them and say, am I really hearing this? And unless you have that, that professor or that teacher who's able to say, yes, in fact, you're hearing this, the discipline of French studies might tell you, no, 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 you're not hearing that. That's, that's, a, that's a canonical author, continue on, right? I think Robin Mitchell's work, uh, Venus Noir, also encourages us to sort of, to think about our place as critics and, and what our, our critical work can do in order to teach people how to talk about Black women, Caribbean women as people, rather than as objects, rather than as um, sites of discourse, patriarchal, sexist, homophobic discourse, that only does further violence to the women and their memory. The idea of also venance is in, in that word, I not only hear um, to re-remember or remember um, somebody who has been demembré, but the really the reconstitution, the putting back together, the putting back to the piecing back together of memory. Um, and, and maybe also une mémoire en péché, right? So I offer all of this to say that um, I have learned so much from your work. Um, I hear it resonating with um, not just critical work, but creative work. Um, once again, I'm thinking of um, uh, Marlene Nobesi Phillips' Zong and the way she talks about defending the dead in her conversation with Patricia Saunders in 2008, right? This idea that, well, if the fragments are there, somebody needs to come along and piece together the fragments and that piecing together that act of care is a way of, of you know, providing ceremony for this person who has been démembré or potentially misremembered in so many ways. So thank you and I, I look forward to our discussion. Thank you so much, uh, Nathan. And uh, I would like to quickly thank Patty Markson, who just put a little notes. And you know, we hope uh, we'll get your book too. Uh, and hopefully we start a nice discussions. I think right now what we could do, we could go to the question of Kimberly Jones uh, because answering this question, we'll ask also Annie to comment on the fabulous, fabulous presentation on, you know, that Gladys and Nathan uh, provided us. And I'm really happy I invited you guys. I knew you'd be great. For one second, I was scared, but it's just me, it's Friday. But you were you know, beyond my expectations. So Kimberly is asking uh, Dr. Cusius, so can Dr. Cusius comment on the ways the Black, the black women scholars most particularly are challenged by the limits of the archive to answer questions about black women. And I will say archives or reviewer too, but that's uh, a different question. How did uh, your questions change or methods to research change based on the reality of the archive? And here again, we have the idea of methodology that both Dr. Francis and Dr. Dyes highlight highlighted that literally Annie's book Dr. Kirsch's great work is also a very good and thorough and useful uh, methodological tool to rethink a lot of, I would just say biases, not to say something else, you know, or ideas, misconceptions about not only the Caribbean, but what a black woman in the Caribbean is, or mulatres or mixed women or women with light colors, eyes, and all those elements. And Annie was very clear, but also Gladys to show it's a prison. So Annie, could you just answer that questions and whatever I added, and then we start our discussion. Thank you, Jacqueline. Thank you, Kimberly. I'm, I, I'm very happy that you asked this question because uh, this is one of the aspects of, um, 
the answer that I wanted to continue. But you, you know, the, the initial question that you asked me, Jacqueline, about um, uh, why Suzanne Cezanne, how did I meet her? So I wanted to kind of, you know, expand on this, 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 this idea of how difficult it was for me to have access to her correspondence or anything else that could help me um, write this book. Um, but before I answer the question, I really want to thank Nathan and Gladys for this fabulous forum. Um, I would say analysis, but analysis is too little. Um, comments, whatever of my book. It's really, it really actually, when I hear your, um, your exploration of my book, I am even more convinced that I need to write the second book that is actually already uh, really well advanced um, because I find so many connections between what you said, the notion of Lyonnage, for example, um, Gladys, that you brought up, uh, that was at the back of my mind, actually, when I was um, crafting the notion of Lian dialectic. And um, so thank you, thank you so much. And Nathan, what you said about uh, Etude Musée, the idea of museum is so fundamental because I start the book with my encounter with Suzanne Césaire in this, at the Musée d'Orsay in Paris about two to three years ago for this uh, exhibition on the black models. And when I'm about to leave, the exhibition, I look at uh, the books that are on the books and I see Suzanne Césaire and I had just actually finished the book and it was already um, at the, the publisher, it was being read. And I was like, this is absolutely unbelievable. What, uh, what an account. So, so it's after that that I said, okay, I definitely need to add this to to the book because this is um this this is too good to be true so the question about uh the ways that black uh women scholars must particular uh, must on the ways that black women scholars um are challenged by the limits of the archive um this this actually is directly related to the method that I chose uh, to write this book. Um, at the very beginning, it was for me um, the anxiety of the method, I should say, because I didn't have any other documents, any other notes that I could reach out to besides the articles that she wrote in Tropi. Yet I knew that there could have other elements uh, available somewhere that I could draw upon in order to fine tune my arguments. That I could not have access to those arguments. So either they existed, but I couldn't have, I didn't have permission, or I had this intuition that they could exist somewhere, but I didn't have any, um, let's say, concrete um, elements to prove that this is where I could go to find those documents. So, and this is again an anecdote, Kimberly, at one point I was at the Bibliothèque Nationale and I was um, going through tones and tones of letters. I was actually reading the correspondence of Emile Césaire with other, uh, other writers and scholars of his time. And I became really frustrated by not being able to locate anything uh, regarding uh, Suzanne Cetia. When she was mentioned in this, um, in, the, in, in this correspondence I just mentioned, it was her name or something en passant where she would be there. So she would still be very, very silenced. And the frustration grew to the point that I was like, I, I think that I really have to really find the entire method of the book because I cannot find anything. And then at some point, returning to the day and the following morning, just came to my 
to my mind that maybe looking in another particular file well that someone had brought to me and this lady was really nice and she was saying well I'm just trying to help out so how about going into this file maybe you you are going to find something about Susan Cesar and it was not a file on Susan Cesar it was a dossier on Aimé Cesar so she was present within um, uh, Aimé Cesar's correspondence so you see how the process, the archaeological process that the title refers to and that the book relies on in terms of a method, this is, I think I would say, the embodied experience that I had at the archives that resurfaced in the method and also um, that I combine, that I summarize in the choice of the title of the book. So. Um, the, in a way, access to, and I believe that probably is the case for uh, Jacqueline, for example, I know that you work on um, the, the Nada sisters. I'm pretty sure that it's very difficult to have access to papers, to correspondence in them. And I bet that it would be absolutely complex to find anything on Lucie Thézé, whose poems in Tropic are absolutely stunning and they need to be um, analyzed. Um, and I suspect that it would probably be the same also for Michel Lacrosier. So there is a systematic pattern of silencing and a pattern of classification, um, an hierarchy of classification that makes those papers, those documents totally out of our reach. And we, Black women, um, and, and actually, I would not want to um, focus essentially on the idea of race here. I would rather say scholars, uh, whatever the race is, scholars really interested in unsilencing, unmasking those uh, literary scholars. Um, it's very, and, 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 and I mean, and, and, and I really believe that it's true. I think that there is a, maybe an unconscious uh, pattern of blocking the memory of those uh, scholars. So um, what I think that, I, that, that is interesting for us is that, uh, Jacqueline, I know that in a previous um, webinar, we talked a lot about uh, the canon, uh, how, critical theory in the Caribbean is um, composed, is made of a, a, a group of, um, of, of writers that we constantly refer to and that we teach as well in our, in our undergraduate and graduate courses. And my, my proposal for, 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 for all of us today is to kind of rethink the ways in which we, literary scholars, we are ourselves responsible for the formation of this canon. Those writers, they produce their texts, but who study those texts? Us, our students. So in our pattern of classifying, of establishing of hierarchy of what needs to be quoted, uh, who, who would come in the footnote to bolster our ideas? We are responsible for reaching out to other patterns of, uh, of thinking, other writers who've said important things, but who are still in the shadow. So I guess that my answer to Kimberly's question is twofold. First, we, as literary scholars, we need to change our way of teaching and our way, and our, also our way of um, producing thinking. Uh, this hegemony of one, single epistemological framework that is composed of a set of uh, writers and thinkers um, coming from the Caribbean and most of them are male thinkers. I think that this is about time to 
rethink the ways in which we do our thinking and bring more conversation between those thinkers and also those who do not already exist in the canon. And um, my book is about Susan Caesar, but I'm pretty sure that there are thousands, no, no, maybe not thousands, I'm exaggerating, but hundreds, let's say, of other Black scholars, Black writers who are there and we don't really know anything about them. So my proposal for us is to open the lines, the patterns, the methods of a more systematic conversation between the canon as it exists right now, and what we as cultural theorists, we need to do in terms of re a redefinition of, 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 of this account. Uh, so to go on with the, the, the notion of um, archaeology, let's focus for a minute about Suzanne Césaire's play, Aurore de la Liberté, which is lost, which is another telling example, you know, of how difficult it is to have access to to papers, to documents that could help us really dig into our analysis. I became familiar with the play thanks to the interviews of two actors to, who were in the play, Michel Lagier and uh, Emile Capgras. And I remember how moving it was for those two men to admit to me that they could not find in their papers, in their personal archives, any traces of the, uh, of the play in which they were actors. And, um, and it was very moving because they understood very, very well the urgency to have access to the play to locate it somewhere or even have one page of it so that we could do something out of this unique page. And there was a sense of melancholia, I remember when I interviewed them, uh, both of them. And then later on, uh, it was just an interview with um, Mr. Cabra. Um, and it was interesting because uh, Kimberly, they strived to remember the rehearsal, what they did. And those men were in their seventies. And the play was uh, staged uh, and represented in Martinique in the 50s, in the early 50s. So going back, you know, 50 years um, into their memory and trying to um, explain to me how they played, what they did, what Suzanne Césaire did in terms of advising them for the, for the mise en scène, who was there, and and, and it was very emotional so that they could also remember little anecdotes, how Suzanne Césaire's kids would come and jump everywhere and play while she was trying to do something with the actors. So, so for me, that was moving. And this is part of the kind of archives that I used. And this is part of the archives that probably other graduate students or other scholars would need to um, uh, would need to, to play with, would need to deal with when access to the official archive in an official library, in an official dossier is even blocked, lost, or you can find it. So this is a long answer, Kimberly, but I think that what I'm trying to say here is that scholars uh, working on those silenced uh, writers need to become um, really, in, we, need to, we really need to innovate in the ways in which they craft the methods and the ways in which they actually bring the method into the writing. Because this is what was really actually difficult for me to realize how difficult it was for me but draw from the difficulty and bring it into my body, my experience and, um, and, and, and spread it laid out into the, the, the writing. So, so needless to say that the writing process was long and sometimes uh, frustrating, but at the same time enjoyable. So, that, so that's my, uh, my answer to, to this question.
sorry, I was muted. I was like, yeah, that's so great. Uh, so we have Jennifer Boitin who's saying thank you for a great presentation. So we have about 10 minutes left. So I will just ask um, Nathan and Gladys for a quick question or commentary for, uh, uh, for Annie and then, and Kimberly, Annie say thank you. That was a lovely, okay. we don't care about how long it is. It was a <laughs> lovely uh, answer. Uh, so just kind of a kind of conclusion, Nathan, Gladys, Dr. Dice, uh, Dr. Francis, a little question, uh, commentary for Annie and then so short and sweet. We want to start. Très bien, je vais, je vais commencer. Um, uh, Annie, um, there is so much that I want to, to say about the book. And I think it might be a space where we do our own La Coucréole. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. But I, I want to ask you that one. And I know it might be a bit daring. But when I read the book, I, I think I, I talked about it in my presentation, I felt the tension. You had to explain the difficulty of the task and it was bold. You took the time to explain why it was necessary. Um, it reminded me of the start of uh, Fabienne Canor's novel, Humus. And she's like, okay, how am I going to present what I found in the archive? How am I going to say it and still be respectful? I don't want to be sensational about it either. And that's where I would like to stop with you for a second, if you could entertain me. The notion of pudeur, um, the camouflaging that is happening, the people who are not talking because for so many reasons that they have reasons, excuses, lots of guilt and shame uh, that you encountered in the research. But what I'm interested in is really you because you still have to deal with that. You have to deal with their silence. You know it's a silence. You have to deal with what is given and what is not given and understand why it's not given. So how, as you are trying to work on the evitement, did you at any time, and I can think about this piece on Etienne, the dossier secret, and I adored the way you had to really present, okay, remember this author who wasn't the author, Remember patriarchy, remember all that. We also have to keep this in mind, but you are being very, that's why I was talking about repetition, being gentle, um, but also purposeful in the way in which you are presenting the dossier secret. So my question is, Annie, did you at some point felt, did you at, at some point feel that you had to do it more in, 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 you know, in some of the information you are receiving? Uh, in terms of respecting the memory of Suzanne Césaire, what was that tension like for you? Thank you, Gladys, for this important question. And uh, of course, we're not going to reveal everything now so that people can go out there and buy <laughs> the book. Okay. <laughs> so there is, um, there is in, indeed, there is indeed, um, um, uh, there, there are two moments where I um, practice the avoidance, the evitement. First, it was my first interview about Suzanne Césaire with Aimé Césaire himself. And um, it was interesting because before I went to, before I met with him, I remember that the people who had arranged the interview with me, they, they, they insisted and they said, don't talk about Suzanne. Make sure that, and if you do, make sure that you know exactly how you're going to talk to him about Suzanne. And another person said, well, actually, if you could even avoid talking about and say something else, talk about negritude, he, he will be really happy, loved. He really loves, uh, you know, remembering um, those, uh, those, those, those very intense um, moments in, in, in the ways in which he, 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 he crafted the notion of negritude. So I said, okay, this is not the purpose of the interview. I'm going to meet with him to talk about Suzanne. So what, how do I do? So I didn't listen. So I said, okay, 
uh, I'm going to ask the questions. And indeed, that was difficult. And I could feel the pain and the melancholia. He barely answered the questions and he could only, and I actually say that in the book, I think it's an introduction. He said very often, nous. Nous avons beaucoup travaillé, we worked a lot. Nous avons beaucoup pensé à ces questions. We thought about those questions together. We worked a lot. And when I kept asking him how, what was Suzanne's position? Because I clearly understood that it was a, that it was a constant collaboration and a rich collaboration between the two of them. So when I tried to focus on what Suzanne's actually had at, at proposal, he would avoid, he would avoid answering and, and I could see the pain. At that point, Gladys, I decided to choose for the editement. And I asked him questions about negritude, about Senghor, about other things so that I could, uh, and I was like, I thought it's probably the only time I'm going to meet with Emile Césaire. And it was the first time he's old. I might never have the opportunity to meet with him again. So let me ask him, all those other questions that I have been asking myself, you know, for so long. So let me grab the opportunity. And he was really happy to talk about negritude, saint girl, for the news, and so on and so forth. So I had myself practice the evitement, and I understood what people had warned me and say, and you don't talk about Suzanne. Second evitement, the dossier secret by Etienne. And I know that I have discussed this a lot with a lot of close friends um, and, um, and, 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 and I think that at some point I didn't want to include any discussion about this dossier secret because I was reluctant to do something that I actually, I actually said that at the very beginning of the book. I said, this book is not a, it's not a biography and I have no intention whatsoever to uh, go out there and um, tell a readership about Suzanne Césaire's and Amy Césaire's private life. I am not interested in this. What I am interested in is to unmask Suzanne Césaire and dig into whatever I have to dig in to unmask it. So that was a challenge, Gladys. I have this dossier secret where Etienne make, make all those revelations and I'm like, okay, but where is Suzanne Césaire? She's dead. So we cannot have her truth. We do not have any means of confronting or rethinking about what Etienne says. So I was um, really torn between keeping into myself this idea that she's not there anymore to tell her truth and to actually comment on Trois Femmes de Race and the ways in which she's being uh, diffused into the book. And then I thought of myself as a scholar. And, a, and as I said at the, at the very beginning, when I was answering to Gladys's question, uh, sorry, Jacqueline's question, um, I believe that what I do in my work, what I've been doing, you know, from so many years is to reveal what people consider not, uh, not, not nice, too ugly, too slow, too poor, not good enough, you know? So I said to myself, if that's how I think that my work, uh, if, 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 if this is how I believe that my work is, why should I go into the evitement? Why should I all of a sudden silence myself and silence Susan Césaire a second time? So, um, so it was till the very last moments before I sent the manuscript to my publisher that I thought about it carefully, doing yoga. I think that the yoga probably helped me find a way out of this. And I said to myself, no, um, this is 
an element that I want to bring to the discussion to really um, show to the audience what you can find in an archive, how you deal with it, how you build a method out of it, and how you as a scholar, you have to be able to negotiate feelings, scholarship, and a readership who is who likes to be pampered, but also who likes to be challenged. This is what the readership is. They want to be pampered. They want to see everything they have in their mind in the book. But at the same time, they want to be challenged by not having what they were expecting. So to me, this dossier secret was a way to break the silence, break it. So I almost fell into the evitement, Gladys. I almost till the very last moment when I said to myself, no, let's talk about it. I am not revealing for the sake of revealing to make a big fuss about it and to do a mise en scène de, de, de moi-même, de soi. This is not what I do. And I, uh, and, and I hate doing mise en scène de soi. I'm a scholar first and foremost. And I have found something, I present it, I give the context, and it's up to the reader with their intelligence to appreciate or reject. Maybe some people would say, oh no, this is not the way she should have said that. That's fine, that's fine. But I think that it's the intelligence of the readers that I am um, um, not questioning, but that I am, uh, that I expect when I decide, when I decided to put um, those elements into the book and, and also tie them to the literature that is, that, that, that surrounds those revelations because he says clearly in the Dossier Secret, well, this is uh, what is in Trois Femmes de Race. So you, I'm a literary scholar, I go to Trois Femmes de Race and I do see what is the, what it, what it reveals in the Dossier Secret. So for me, again, as a, Final answer to your question, Gladys, is, yeah, uh, um, how do we, as we write, we know that there is a readership who wants to see things, who may not want to see things, but ultimately, it's the intelligence that I want to have um, from, that I want to receive from the readers. Merci, Annie. Thank you, Annie, for this great uh, response. And this is why I talked at the beginning of, you know, you're not, your, your goal is not to create another mythology, but if someone could talk about Le Dossier Secret, it was you because you do it with grace and uh, respect. And I think Evitement is what we've been trained to do. <laughs> and uh, what Gladys and Fagnathan, uh, you know, um, have been, uh, pointing to is be brave. Um, writing a book often is an exercise of bravery. Already writing and you know having like someone writing the first draft is a you know then you writing it. But when you encounter difficult uh, elements, then again you have to decide uh, what you what you have to do. And basically anyone could find this dossier anyway. So I really believe that. The, the way you engage with it, uh, you know, is, is, is the perfect way for that particular, um, you know, document. And, it, it, and it, I think it's all this idea about reframe our methodology and all the discussion we've been having. Nathan, last question, comments. Thank you. That was such a wonderful answer. And it really um, it made me wonder more about method and what you were saying about um, l'horreur de la liberté. Um, I myself have have tried to work with the like lost plays of, of Haitian playwrights or lost acts um, where you don't know how the play ends because it's not there. Um, and so your turn to speaking to the actors. Um, there's also a couple of phone conversations that you have um, that you cite. Um, I'm thinking of the one with uh, René Despastres. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I'm wondering too if, if his memory of um, Suzanne Césaire isn't also just entirely influenced by all of the images that we've already consumed about her um, and whether it's not a faulty memory of sorts. 
but you don't go there. You don't sort of say, you know, it is a faulty memory. We can't trust a native past. You have a great deal of respect for what he's saying and for that memory. And I'm wondering sort of what's the path forward for teaching that type of methodology in French and Francophone studies to include oral history, to include an engagement with a cultural, a living cultural archive, right? In the minds of, of um, ancestors and the minds of, of, of the, the, the later generations who have experienced different things than the generation of the student, or maybe the same thing, but that we're all sort of trying to figure out together. And your study provides a place for, for some of those memories, um, but I think it's really just the beginning. Um, could you speculate on, on what the futures of that look like? Thank you, Nathan. This is a difficult question because um, um, I've tried, I remember, I've tried to, in, in, in one graduate seminar that I taught here at the University of Iowa with those brilliant students who kept asking me questions about Suzanne Cesaire's and thanks to their question, I was able to kind of actually dig into a lot of things and, and, and make myself um, more clear. Um, I think that what I have taught those students and other, and other students in other courses, not necessarily um, on, on, on the Caribbean, what I think, what, what I try to express in, the in, in my courses is in the ways in which they have to be innovative and creative and not just, not just accept any yes and no answer from anybody. To ask her questions and there is a, there is a saying in Martinique that, that, that goes and I think that there's, it's probably the same Gladys. Um, when you say, when you say yes, no one is going to ask you why. With any Pucci. So I, I, I think that I kind of try to, to tell my students yes and no is not enough. Um, if you want to be cultural critique, you have to move beyond the yes and no. The, the, I wouldn't say the problem, but the challenge is that going beyond the yes and no means that you really have to be invested. Uh, and uh, not just write a paper for the sake of writing a paper, but really forcing yourself to understand why you chose this topic. And why at some point going through the syllabus and you decided to choose this particular topic, you probably had somewhere an idea of something going on and that you really wanted to, get, to dig into it. So I think that what I try to <laughs> tell my students is, <clears throat> sorry, is um, there, is there is something called intuition in scholarship. And also in order to bring this intuition to uh, something that is tangible, that is concrete, this is where you have to go out of your own body to find the method. So, this is what I tell them, Nathan, but I don't have, a, I would say a final answer in the ways in which they have to go beyond the yes and no. I tell them not to do it, but I, so far, because it's really an embodied experience. It's an embodied experience. I mean, and that's the reason why I think that I cannot give them a definite answer. Um, it's, um, I guess that, And again, I'm going to go back to my answer to Gladys's question about um, my, my work in the archives and the dossier secret. Um, when you find those kinds of documents, you are, you are the only one, even if you have advice from friends, close friends, you know, uh, my husband was also there supporting me and, 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 and kept on asking me all those questions over and over and over again that actually, you know, kind of helped me make the decision. But I think that you alone, so that's the reason why I cannot provide the method, okay? I cannot provide a method and I think it's the, the, the nature, if I, if I can use that word, the nature of your work, your approach to your topic that provides you with the strength, with the inner strength, to decide what the method will be. 
Okay, so I guess that this is the kind of kind of answer that I can provide, Nathan. It is. It's not enough for me, but let's say that we'll meet again in another webinar or face to face. I hope so that we can dig into this question, which is difficult. And I guess what you're saying too is is that as a somebody guiding work, you need to be open to your mentees and your students forging their own way with their own methodology if previous models don't work or prove insufficient or don't or maybe engender that you know acceptance of a yes or a no I'm not, could you rephrase the second part of your because i was kind of thinking of something while you were yeah. talking i'm sorry so could you rephrase okay, okay. yeah no I, I think to me what i'm hearing from you is that as an advisor, as somebody you know, guiding students in their work, um, what you're showing to me is that you're open to students mm -hmm, devising mm -hmm. their own mm -hmm. methodology mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. because you had to, in fact, craft mm -hmm. your own. Mm -hmm. And so to just, you know, copier coller yours yeah. onto theirs would, you know, it would be inorganic. Yeah. Bring it back to the environment, right? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, and I trust. And I trust um, a lot um, a student who comes and tells me, um, this is what I think. I know this is not probably what you expected, but this is what I think I can do. And this is the reason why I think that this is what I want to do. And I like those kinds of approaches because it shows me that there is, as you said, there is an organic um, relationship with the topic. And um, I also believe that, um, I, I, as I said earlier, I strongly believe in, in the intelligence of people. So uh, if a student comes with a method that he or she has crafted and thought about carefully, even if it's not what I was expected, from the moment I see the intelligence and the, the flow, the fluidity behind the method, I'm convinced. So this is what I think I can add to uh, to your comment. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Annie. Thank you, Nathan and Gladys. Before we leave, there's a quick comment and a thank you for Amelia Moyes from Martinique. And you know she's really saying thank you uh, for this great presentation. Uh, Antoine Berger is also uh, congratulating, uh, congratulating us about this great event, yay. Uh, but he's asking some questions about uh, Suzanne Cés the play Suzanne Césaire wrote in 1952. But I think you've been explaining that, again, archives, mm -hmm. and this could be a, a different discussion. So I think what, uh, and René Larrier saying thank you. <laughs> So I think what we've been seeing today is really this, the importance of utilizing archives, but redefining how we see them. Uh, the importance of literally being committed, even if, with your own body, because sometimes documents of readings can attack you or have an impact on your own bodies and you have to react to them. And then being brave. Uh, <laughs> In this period, so many we, we we forget that writing particular topic it's a commitment, but it's also a, an act of bravery to share a particular difficult point on obscure people on only seven articles. So maybe uh, the last word could be: It's nice to read reviews, comments of evaluators, reviewer number two, but at the end of the day, you have to also believe in your own project and believe in the jeu, and the jeu can be also we, but believing in just sharing knowledge and preserving a particular type of knowledge, not only for us, but for the people uh, who will come after us and also be gentle for the people we are forming uh, to whom we are teaching uh, so that they are the next generation and they also teach us things about different ways to approach a text, to approach 
a writer and to approach also uh, the field. Uh, so thank you very much for being uh, here today with me on this Friday afternoon. Uh, it was my pleasure to have you all and hopefully I will see you uh, face to face. I thank again also our audience for being here. Okay. Just want to say again, uh, again, thank you to the audience. Thank you, Nathan, Gladys, and Jacqueline. Uh, and thank you to the technical team at RISE for helping us out with the technology. Um, this was really, I'm really thrilled. You know, I, I'm really happy. Um, this conversation um, means a lot to me because I see how, you know, it's always frightening to, <laughs> to, to hear people talk about your book, but, but I think that's your rigor. The, the, your rigor, uh, Gladys, Jacqueline, and Nathan helps me realize uh, how I could go further into um, analyzing um, uh, other parts of Susan's work. And as I said earlier, um, her work should not be in a vacuum. Let's bring her in conversation with um, most of the writers, most of the scholars that we that we work with. Um, it wouldn't hurt. It would make our work and it would make our students, you know, happier, probably because they see all of a sudden a new face in the discussion, a new text. So I think that it is important that we actually um, balance, that we balance intelligently the, the, the different mechanism that we craft as we produce scholarship. And, and I think that this is what Suzanne Césaire has actually done. And my concept, Yann Dialectic, also refers to that. She has been in conversation, not in dialogue, but she has established patterns of conversation with all those, um, with this ecosystem of, 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 of people, whether it is Frobenius, whether it's Breton, whether it's Leris, she was in conversation because I think that intuitively she believed that this conversation was the way to craft this emancipatory, this new literature, this new, um, this new critical framework. So, um, so just to pay an homage to Suzanne Césaire, let's just do that. So that will be my final words. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Annie. Thank you.